impact in computers and software. And then that's when uh, you know the, the the event happened that is what most people kind of tend to associate with the uh, term bug, which is uh, that the first actual bug and uh, actual debugging, so removal of the bug, uh, happened uh, in the group of uh, Admiral Grace Hopper. They were working on this Mark II computer and at Hardware University, and they found an actual moth in a relay, and that's what was causing a malfunction. And I also happen to have the you know picture of the bug report here, and this is a you know. Uh, never a name has been more appropriate than bug report in this case because you have a moth taped into the into the report, and and so the, the legend has it that this is the reason why they're called bugs. Uh, the term was actually used before, but it's a, it's a very nice story. So people uh, keep uh, telling this uh, telling this story. So going uh, more to the kind of uh, technical debugging uh, work, I'm going to first mention a couple of practical approaches uh, that were used uh, over the years, and then I'm going to switch to the more research part. So the more research uh, research techniques uh, about debugging. And so the, the first example of real debugger uh, was the symbolic debugging uh, performed into the Unipack 1100, which is a very, very old machine, and it was called FLIT, which stands for full location by interpretive uh, testing. And so what FLT was doing, it was FLIT was doing, it was able to load uh, a core dump. So uh, many of you may be old enough to remember core dumps, or, or maybe you, you, you still see them. But it was this idea that you know when the program was crashing, it was dumping. Uh, the memory and uh, Flick allowed you to load this memory and actually interpret uh, the dump as if you were in a sort of virtual machine, which was very advanced uh, for the time being. Because we talk, we're talking about 1962. Uh, uh, then you know uh, came GDB, and I'm sure that you know that many of you have uh, developed you know uh, C code, uh, no GDB or C or C++ code. No GDB, GDB is very uh, very popular. Uh, the debugger was also integrated in various environments. Uh, then uh, uh, there's another very nice tool that I'd like to uh, mention is DDD, because uh, uh, DDD was a sort of building on, uh, on GDB, at least I think GDB was the base, but was giving you a, a, a graphical representation of memory. So it was ideal, and I used it actually personally quite a bit. Uh, if you were working with, for example, dynamic memory structures, it would allow you to navigate. Uh, the, the memory structure and will allow you to find uh, very subtle bugs involving, for example, the heap and, and uh, heap uh, memory. So uh, it's very, very, very useful. And actually, a little known fact is that, uh, uh, again, this is another case in which I will ask the, uh, ask the audience. So I'm going to give you a second uh, to, to, to put it on, on Slack if you know it. But uh, uh, it's a little known fact that uh, the developer of DDD, the creator of DDD, is Andrea Zeller. Who is like you know very famous in the uh, debugging area because also developed a, a number of uh, of other uh, in, important techniques. But you know not many people know that he was actually you know was actually uh, also a very good uh, developer and implementer and he created DDD back in the days. Okay, so now you know for the more researchy part, uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about a number of techniques that I believe were uh, you know, groundbreaking techniques in the area of debugging. And for each technique, I'm going to mention the technique. I'm going to give you the intuition behind it and explain it with an intuitive uh, example as much as possible. So uh, we're going to start with program slicing. And so probably many of you are familiar with the idea of program slicing. Uh, and you'll see in a second uh, what I mean exactly by that if, if, uh, if you're not. Uh, but the, the intuition here was that the developers slice backwards when the button. What does that mean? That they observe a failure a problem in the code, the manifestation of a problem in the code, and they basically go from the manifestation of the failure back in the program to find out what, what's the root cause of that uh, problem. So uh, Weiser had this uh, very interesting idea in 1981, so uh, 30 years ago or so, uh, actually, sorry, uh, 40 years ago or so, uh, I'm really getting old, and, uh, and um, the, the, the breakthrough paper was this idea of trying to do automatically this sort of process of slicing backwards uh, through the code. So let me illustrate that with an example. And uh, I'm going to use this example for many other techniques, so, so you don't have to see too many pieces of code. It's a very simple uh, uh, piece of code. It's, uh, it's a, a function that takes three integers, reads three integers, and uh, prints the middle one in terms of uh, value, so the one with the middle value. And so you can see that it performs some computation, and then at the end, it prints the results. And you can also see that there's a bug uh, at line seven, uh, where uh, line seven is identical to line five, but in fact, uh, that should not be the case. So this is probably some copy and paste error. 
I also like to point out that, you know, uh, in case it wasn't, it wasn't clear that the, uh, for the sake of the example, we have an annotation of the syspy. Normally in the code, you don't have that. So uh, a technique that is based on, on looking for the, the comment bug in the, in the code is not going to work uh, uh, very well. So looking at this code, uh, if you think about it, the way slicing works, uh, you will start from line 13, which is where the manifestation of the problem is. Because if there's a wrong computation, you, this is where the point where you will see that the wrong result is printed. And at that point, you will follow what are called uh, uh, data and control dependencies. So data dependencies are basically uh, dependencies between statements such that one statement defines a value and the other one uses it. So in this case, for example, if you look at line 13 where M is printed, uh, you can see that M uh, could be defined in a number of places in the code. So you will start by adding to the slice these places. So for example, you will line uh, at line 12, 10, seven, five, and two, because these are all places where M could be defined and then used. So uh, if something goes wrong in any of these definition, it, you know, the problem might manifest in 13. Then you also follow control dependencies. What are control dependencies? Basically, you know, in, intuitively, you could say that a statement is control dependent on another one if the execution of this statement determines whether uh, the first statement is uh, uh, executed or not. So in this case, for instance, uh, line 11, this uh, if statement, f, uh, you know, if x greater than z, is the one determining whether uh, m equal to x at line 12 is executed or not. So you will start including these statements. And basically, then you continue transitively by adding more control dependencies and more data dependencies until you have, uh, you know, basically the, the transitive closure of these dependencies, and that's your slice. So it's a great technique. It's, it's automated. You can just run it, uh, uh, you know, in a, in a tool. What's the problem? Well, you know, if we continue the slides here, for example, this is what you will get. So you will get that at the end uh, of the analysis, the whole code is included in the slides. And that's exactly the problem with, uh, with slicing, uh, that, you know, a conservative slice tends to include a lot of code. And so it doesn't necessarily help you much uh, with uh, debugging. And in fact, you know, uh, then, you know, uh, after this, uh, you know, an, a number of techniques have been developed into different kinds of slicing uh, in order to improve uh, these initial results. Uh, and, and the technique was still, you know, really groundbreaking because it uh, uh, generated tons of research. So a lot of people have been working on, on slicing. If you look at the number of citations of, of this paper, it's, uh, you know, the number is staggering. But, but nevertheless, uh, for debugging, it's not particularly useful in its, uh, you know, uh, original uh, definition. So now going back to, the, to our history, uh, then people started thinking about uh, a different way of computing slices. Instead of computing static slices, so slices that account for all the possible behavior of the program, they will start, uh, they will start thinking about dynamic slices. What are dynamic slices? There are slices when you only, only consider the dependencies that were actually exercised within an execution. And so Coral and Lasky, uh, the, the, proposed the, the idea of dynamic slicing in 1988. And then in 1993, Agro proposed uh, uh, the idea of using dynamic slicing for debugging. So let me give you again a, a quick uh, idea of how uh, dynamic slicing will work. Uh, we're going to add some information, for example. In particular, we're going to add uh, uh, some uh, test cases. And uh, for the test cases, we're going to show you, uh, I'm going to show you the input, uh, which are three numbers. I'm going to show you whether it passed or failed. And I'm going to show you which statements were covered. So in this case, uh, we, we see that if we pass 335 as inputs, uh, these are the statements that will be covered uh, in the code, uh, and uh, the, the test will pass. And uh, I have uh, six test cases, uh, five pass and one failed, uh, which, you know, again, uh, so in a, even on a small example like this can show you how difficult it might be to find, uh, to find the bug because, you know, here the majority of test cases uh, actually pass uh, instead of uh, failing. And so this is a starting point for dynamic slicing. So what you will do, imagine that, you know, what we will do in this case, that we will start slicing for the last test case, which is the one failing. So we will again start from line 13, because that's where you see the manifestation of the bug. But in this case, uh, we will not follow all the dependencies. We will follow only the dependencies that were exercised in this execution. Why? Well, because, you know, if you're debugging a failure, it doesn't make sense to consider all the possible uh, behaviors of the program. It makes sense to consider the behaviors that were actually involved in the failure. So that's you know, a fairly intuitive uh, idea. And in this case, if we compute the slice, this is what we get. Uh, you might wonder if you're not familiar with slicing why line two was not uh, included. And the reason why line two was not included 
is because uh, uh, the definition here is actually overwritten or killed, if you want to use the terminology in, uh, uh, in data flow analysis, uh, at line seven. So in this case, uh, this m equal to z, this value will never reach the, uh, the final output. Okay, so this will be the slice. And so I will ask you, is this much better than static slicing? Clearly it's better because you can see that there's many uh, fewer statements that are actually reported. But if you think about it, uh, what's the starting point for this? An execution, right? So what would be sort of the, the, the baseline for, for this kind of analysis? It will be the trace because you will never look at statements that were never executed. So in a sense, uh, you know, it doesn't really help you that much either because uh, you're only skipping for this specific example, at least one statement. So the only one that you're really not looking at is the statement to otherwise all the other ones in the trace are there. So again, it's a great idea. Uh, it's, it's kind of a little more uh, focused than if you wish than a static lighting because it considers actual behavior of the filling execution, but still it's fairly inaccurate. It's fairly you know, imprecise. And so the, the, the next technique I want to talk about in terms of slicing, and then I'm going to kind of uh, change to a different kind of techniques, uh, is Y-line. Uh, Y-line that was defined by uh, Amy Coe and Brett Myers. And it defined uh, at this point uh, a good uh, uh, 12 years ago, probably. And then I'm going to show you also in this case, I'm not going to use the example because it's a little more complex than that, but I'm going to show you uh, in an intuitive way by using a, a video that is a demo that is available on uh, Amy's page. So here we have a program, and imagine that this is a drawing program, so you can draw uh, shapes, uh, then you can change the color, and you can draw other shapes. Uh, and if you look at what happens here on, uh, on, uh, on this uh, uh, screen, you can see that there's something wrong, right? Because uh, you selected uh, blue as the color for, uh, for the drawing. And nevertheless, uh, first of all, uh, the, the, the color on the, on the band is not blue, and also the color of the shape that's been drawn is not, uh, uh, is not blue, it's actually black. And so what does, uh, so the, the question that would be kind of natural to ask are, why didn't this color panel change? Why didn't it become uh, you know, uh, the right color? And uh, why is this stroke black instead of being uh, blue? And that's exactly what Y-Line does. So Y-Line basically supports the developer in this kind of a question-driven investigation. So in this case, uh, what it will do, it will analyze the, the program. You can think about instantiating this in many different ways. So in this case, it's a graphical program. So imagine that what you will do, you will click on a point on the screen and you will look at the properties of this point and you will generate a set of questions that the developers might wanna ask. In this case, might be questions about the coordinates of the point, uh, or the, the, the width, uh, the height, uh, and the color, among other things. And as a developer, you will select this uh, question because of course uh, the, what you're wondering is why the color is wrong. And when you click on that, uh, on that question, what it will do, it will open the code that is related to that, uh, to that property. And in this case, it will show you that, so below there's basically a, a sort of a, a timeline of the execution uh, of, of the program. So it will tell you which events led to this, uh, uh, this, this state. And uh, in, the, in the higher part, it will show you which object is the one that uh, is actually being uh, changed and, and has the wrong color. And, and you can go one step forward. So at this point, you know that the problem is that this color is wrong. And so you can click on that again. And, the, and again, the, the tool, the, the technique, what we'll do, we'll look at the code and it will generate questions. So in this case, the questions might be, uh, why did this execute? And if you think about it, why did this execute is basically asking, what is the control dependence? Or what are the control dependencies for this statement? Or why is the color of this value? And again, this is just asking, give me the next data dependence, right? So it's allowing you to basically uh, uh, analyze uh, a dynamic slice step by step and based on what you think is relevant. So you are at the same time pruning because you're not following dependencies that you think are relevant. And you're also doing one step at a time instead of being overwhelmed with this um, information all at once. And if you happen to click on, you know, why, uh, which is the natural thing to click, uh, why is the color RGB 000, instead of being uh, the corresponding RGB value for blue, what you will get is that you will get basically this data dependence that will show you that the value of color up there is actually defined uh, on the, this uh, new instantiation of color. And if you look at the new instantiation of color, you can clearly see, and I'm gonna highlight it for you, there's a, the, the value of the G slider, the green slider is copied twice instead of uh, having you know, the green slider and the blue slider in the next line. 
and that's where the bug is. So basically with just two steps and these two questions, you, you could find out very easily, then this is where the, the problem uh, is. And why do I like this technique? I mean, I, I love to talk about this technique uh, because I think it's a perfect example of how an existing technique, which is dynamic slicing, can really be used and improved by uh, building the right approach on top of it. So in this case, again, what, and I remember having this discussion with Amy when she interviewed at Georgia Tech again <laughs> a centuries ago, but, uh, and uh, I was saying, well, basically we are talking about, uh, you know, dynamic slicing on steroids. And, uh, and we have this interesting discussion, and, and it's, to some extent it is true that the underlying technique is dynamic slicing, but you know, the intelligence that you put on top of it by making it kind of question driven and by making it so that it's one step at a time really overcomes the limit between a, a technique that might be useless and a technique that might be very useful. So this is the first point in the talk where I'm gonna kind of uh, stress that you know, it's very important to keep in mind how people work and how you can really help developers. So keep keeping developers in, in, in mind. So this is something that, uh, you know, Amy did when developing Wireline and maybe, you know, uh, Agrawal didn't do when, when thinking about dynamic slicing because you want to think about who's going to be the final consumer of your information. So what would you, who your tools are served. And uh, it's not surprising that, you know, this work actually won uh, an ICSI uh, 10 year most influential paper award uh, uh, at ICSI 2018 uh, and a well-deserved one. It's a very prestigious and well-deserved one. Okay, next technique, uh, next uh, breakthrough technique, uh, in my opinion, delta debugging. Uh, I'm not the only one thinking this, of course. Uh, in, in this case, the intuition, uh, the way I like to put it is uh, that it's all about differences. So the, the idea here was, uh, you know, uh, from uh, Andrea Zeller, and he wanted to do sort of this automatic uh, isolation of failure causes. And uh, uh, what's, so what's the basic, uh, basic idea? The idea is that if I have something that works and something that doesn't work, and they're like related, like for example, subsequent versions of the program or uh, you know, different versions of an input, I can actually automatically sort of go from one to the other using some, some kind of binary search and find out uh, what the problem is. And in fact, it's not surprising that the first paper from uh, Andreas, and I remember seeing the presentation actually, is like yesterday my program worked, today it does not. Why? It's a very, very indicative title. So let's see what, what, what I mean when I talk about this binary search. Uh, I, in this case, I'm not, again, I'm not gonna use the code, I'm just gonna give you an intuitive view. So imagine that this is your program from today. Uh, you run it and it fails. And by the way, I'm sure all of you had this experience. Uh, you, you, you have your program, uh, yes, it was working perfectly. You do some changes that you think are totally relevant and everything falls apart. And you start thinking like, why in the world is this happening? I mean, I only change these two things. So imagine this as the mindset, right? So you have this program today it fails. You have this program from yesterday that worked. And instead of you going nuts and trying to figure out what's the problem, what Delta debugging will do, and again, you can do it in different ways as you know, uh, uh, techniques are being defined on top of that and improve the process. But the, 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 the basic way is like you take uh, uh, intuitively half of the program from today and half from yesterday. And you put them together in a way that compiles and you can think about doing it in a smart way. And then you run it. If the program passes, what this is telling you and uh, that the problem is not in the, the part of today's program that you put there. So you can put this on the stack of the, of the programs that work and you can start focusing on the second half. And so at this point, you create another program where you have, uh, you know, what passed, uh, what you considered before and then half of today and again and half of yesterday. So you can see how this is some sort of binary search. And I'm giving you a slightly you know, oversimplified version, but it, sh it should give an idea. And imagine that this fails at this point, uh, you know that the problem must be in the part of today's program that you use. And then you could go in this way until you get to a point in which you have a, a change such that when you add it to the program, the program fails. When you remove it, the program passes. And uh, that's necessarily a failure cause. So what's the, uh, so looks perfect and in fact it's a great idea and it's been extremely successful Andreas you know it's been highly recognized for this and rightly so and everybody and their brother and sister have used the delta debugging at some point in their life I believe if you work in this area but uh, you know the, the idea here is that uh, uh, of course uh, the failure cost might be distributed in the program so if that's the case you might end up having you know a failure cost but the failure cost might be very big and uh, so it's basically, it doesn't guarantee minimality. It guarantees one minimality, which means that you get something that if you add it and, or you remove it, you know, it, it makes the difference between failing or passing, uh, but, but it's not necessarily one minimal. 
And besides that, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a really great technique. And in fact, if you think about, uh, uh, you know, kind of practical impact or, you know, practical applicability, if you, if you use Git and you ever use Git Bisect, uh, Git Bisect is pretty much doing something uh, along the lines of, of the applicability. And after this, Andreas then you know apply this to programs, uh, uh, input state. So as I said, you know a lot of people built on this and created different techniques. So this was the kind of the, the core idea, and then you know, been applied in many in many different uh, ways. Next breakthrough uh, in uh, in two thousand one is the idea of statistical debugging. So in this case, uh, uh, the, the main intuition was that uh, well up to now uh, people have been using a failing execution basically in order to figure out. Uh, whether uh, um, some, where the bug is. And there's a whole wealth of information that we're kind of leaving on the table. In particular, we might have multiple failing executions and we might have also multiple passing executions. And we should be able to kind of use this information in order to analyze the program, analyze the executions of the program and find out some information about where the bug might be. And so the, the idea is like, you know, debugging techniques can leverage multiple executions. The first instance, the very first instance is a, a technique called Tarantula. That was, uh, you know, uh, was developed at, at Georgia Tech, so I'm particularly you know, proud of this technique. Not by me, but it was developed by uh, Jim Jones, uh, the late Mary Jean Harold and John Stasco. And uh, they presented it at uh, XC, I believe, 2001, if I recall correctly. But anyways, uh, the, this is uh, the, the way the technique uh, works. And again, I'm gonna use the same example as before in this case to show you. So uh, imagine that you know, what you do is uh, you wanna assign a suspiciousness level. So basically a likelihood of the, of the, of the given statement to be uh, faulty or not. So suspiciousness level for the statement. And uh, the, the suspiciousness is uh, directly proportional to the number of failing test cases or failing executions that go through the statement. And this is very intuitive, right? Because if I have a, you know, 100 executions and they all go through this failing statement, the statement is more suspicious than if I have 100 failing executions and none of them uh, goes through the statement or, you know, or one of them goes through the statement. So again, proportional to the number of uh, failing tests or executions that go through the statement. And uh, it's inversely proportional to the number of passing executions that go through the statement. Again, a very, very intuitive uh, approach, right? Uh, because I'm imagining that if I have a large number of executions that execute the statement and pass, the statement is less likely to be uh, uh, you know, suspicious. And of course, you know, we're talking about a hey, heuristic. You can always think about uh, exceptions. And so this is what the formula gives you. Uh, the, the reason why failed uh, and uh, passed are uh, divided by total failed and total pass is to kind of uh, identify the strength of the signal. So if you have one, uh, so let's say 10 out of 10 failing execution going through the statement, it's a stronger signal than if you have 10 uh, uh, out of 10,000 failing execution going through the statement, of course. So that's the reason why you use that, that value. And similarly for, for, for pass. So let's see how this works for this code. Uh, if we look for the first line, for example, we will have the suspicion of the first statement is uh, uh, you have one failing uh, execution that goes to the statement, so one out of one, and uh, uh, five uh, uh, passing execution uh, going to the statement, so five out of five, and so the, the total is 0 0.5. So it's sort of a, if you were to think about a suspicion as this kind of likelihood, likelihood value, uh, it's sort of middle of the ground uh, a suspicion. So a statement that might be faulty, it might not be faulty. And if you compute the one for the suspicious one, the, the value that we, we get without going through all the numbers, it's 0 0.8. And then, you know, we can do the same thing for the whole program. And you can see that, you know, that 0 0.8 is really the highest one in this case. Uh, of course, there's no guarantee, and of course, it's not necessarily the case that the most suspicious is the, is the, uh, is the faulty statement, but that's, you know, but that's the basic intuition and the idea. So how would you use this information? Uh, in their first paper, uh, Jim and, uh, and uh, his colleagues, uh, we're providing a visualization. So you have some sort of a color-based ranking of the statements. You could think about just providing a ranking that's going from the highest to the lowest. And it, it, the, the basic idea is that as a developer, you have your test suite, you will throw it at the tool, the tool will give you back a rank, and then you will start from the most suspicious statement, check whether it's faulty or not. And then if it's not, you move to the next one, and then to the next one, and then to the next one, okay? So that's the way in which you do an analysis. And of course, the, the, the idea there, the claim is that in most cases, the statement, you're gonna find the statement soon enough, but this is gonna make debugging much more effective. Extremely successful technique. So uh, people loved it. And uh, again, also in this case, uh, 
everybody in one way or another has been building, or has used this at some point, has been building on it, everybody in the area. And, uh, and in fact, you know, uh, the Jim, Mary Jean and John rece received several awards for this work, uh, including a, a very prestigious, prestigious again, ACM Six Soft Impact Award uh, for, the, for their ICSI 2002 paper, which was uh, called uh, Visualization of Test Information, Test Information to Assist uh, for Localization, if I remember correctly. And then, you know, uh, as I said, at the same time, and you know, shortly after other techniques were presented, another very interesting one was CBI, Cooperative Bug Isolation. In this case, uh, this was by, by Lip, Lip, Nike, uh, Zenga, Aiken, and, and Jordan. In this case, uh, the idea was pushed to uh, deploy the execution. Why? And so it's called Cooperative Bug Isolation because you imagine all the people using your software contributing. And, and, and the reason is that one of the limitations of uh, tarantula, by the way, tarantula was called tarantula because uh, uh, tarantulas uh, kill bugs. So that's, that's, you know, just in case you missed uh, that uh, subtlety. And uh, so the idea with CBI was uh, uh, to go overcome one of the limitations of tarantula, which is you need a lot of tests for the statistical analysis to be significant. And what's the best way to get a lot of tests? Well, is to kind of throw your program out in the wild and have people uh, while they execute it, collect this information or, and, and then provide it back to, the, to this analyzer. So that was the idea with CBI, and they also extended a little bit the, the concepts uh, of uh, coverage because they were not just using statement coverage, they were using this predicate that are kind of a, a, a richer source of information. They also had some more sophisticated analysis. And, and, but, you know, but again, you know, the, the basic idea is to do some sort of statistical localization based on a number of execution. Then uh, uh, there was a, a large number of papers uh, who tried to improve the, the, the formula. So uh, the technique and the formula in the first round of a paper was uh, uh, relatively simple. So people started using different kinds of techniques and improving the techniques. Particularly, you know, one uh, worth noticing as became very popular is OKI, which is by, you know, uh, Abreu, Rui Abreu and colleagues, uh, which uses a formula, used the formula adapt from uh, molecular biology in order to do for localization and was you know shown that it was you know uh, tend to be more uh, tend to be more effective than uh, the one in tarantula uh, then people started thinking about the fact that well maybe you know tarantula and these statistical localization techniques are mostly based on casualty causal sorry are mostly based in cor on correlations and not on causality really and so they, they started looking at more sophisticated way uh, to do this in particular using causal uh, inference and uh, some, some, there was some uh, interesting work in that area by you know uh, george Ba. Uh, Andy Polkowski and Mary Jean Harold, uh, uh, again, a collaboration between, uh, between Case Western and, and, and Georgia Tech. Uh, and I, the, the, there, the advantage was that you, you could get rid of a lot of confounding factors in the analysis, but you know, the analysis was more complex. So that's sort of a trade off. And, uh, and another technique that I see sort of related to this is an IR based technique. I, I kind of put it in a similar uh, category. And I'm going to just very quickly mention those because I think they're uh, you know, also interesting techniques. Basically, what you do, uh, if you're familiar with information retrieval, uh, the basic idea here, which I think is a very good intuition, is uh, to uh, use uh, uh, the bug report as sort of a uh, document, a, a search, a query on a, on a corpus of documents, which is the source code. So you have your source code, the, the set of files in your code, uh, and you take the bug and you consider that to be the corpus of documents, and then you do a, a query based on the on the bug report. And the main, the main idea is that then you can rank the source files based on the lexical similarity to the bug report. So if a source file and a bug report contain many common terms, they are likely to be related. And here's an example from the uh, Eclipse SWT, for, for instance. And you can see that you know, this is the, there's a, uh, on the right the, 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 the source file that is most closely related based on the analysis to the bug report. And you can see the reason why, because there is a lot of uh, uh, terms that are actually shared between the between the two, and uh, I, mean, I could have a long conversation about IR based techniques. I'm just gonna uh, leave it at this. If you have questions, you know, feel free feel free to to ask. I think there are some limitations that are not completely stated, but you know, but, uh, uh, we can you know we can talk more uh, about that. But it was you know a very very interesting idea, and again many 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 others. A at some point, uh, you know, there was a. Uh, uh, there were some years in which you couldn't, uh, you know, review for a conference in a, uh, related to testing without getting, or, and testing and debugging or program analysis without getting 
at least uh, 10, 15 papers on statistical poll localization. And that was actually one of the motivations for, for the first uh, uh, version of, the, of this, uh, of this or the kind of the very preliminary version of, of this talk in which, it, as, as I said, it was a little bit of a frustration with all this amount of work that was going into marginal improvements to this, uh, you know, great idea, but, you know, it, again, the, the, it was getting to the point of sort of diminishing return. And, you know, and I'll say a little bit more about that. And, uh, and just to give an idea of how much people work on debugging, debugging is a very expensive activity. If you if you written code, uh, so in, in this day, actually, I'm spending, uh, I don't know if it's because of COVID and I'm home or, or, or why, but I'm spending a lot of time writing uh, auto graders. And, uh, and I never you know, wrote so much code in the last few years. And I'm and also, you know, never had to do so much debugging. And I, that reminded me of how painful debugging is. And it's for this reason, it's painful, it's expensive, it's difficult. So for this reason, uh, basically, uh, People have worked uh, endlessly on, on, on this topic. And so this, uh, I just want to provide here uh, some, just again, a subset of the, the, the number of techniques or kinds of techniques that were developed by, uh, you know, by, by researchers and practitioners on, uh, about debugging. And this is not even a comprehensive uh, list. Okay, so again, what, you, what I, I wish you took away from this first part is that uh, people worked on debugging for a very long time and they generated tons of very, very good ideas, okay? And so that's, that's what the kind of the, the, the past part of the approach. Now, present, um, all these techniques, great techniques, uh, shown to be very effective in, uh, in various evaluation. Can we debug at the push of a button? So is, is it just a matter of actually going and doing it, uh, building the right tool? Or, uh, you know, there's still some, you know, kind of technical limitations and conceptual limitations. And so that's, the, you know, as I said, the second part of this presentation. Uh, so let, let me kind of rewind a little bit and just, you know, kind of flesh out uh, in, a, in a very clear way in case you kind of spaced out at some point uh, what we're talking about here. I'm talking about, I'm focusing on automated debugging techniques or rank-based techniques. The techniques that work by, you know, taking a piece of code, passing it to the, to the tool, and uh, the tool will analyze, uh, the, the, the code will be uh, buggy because uh, there will be some uh, failures that occurred. Uh, and uh, the tool will analyze the code, uh, provide uh, a rank list, uh, and it will tell the developer, here's a list of places to check out. And then the developer, uh, the idea is that they will go through the list uh, and say, okay, I'll, I'll check out these suggestions. And they will check, you know, the first uh, line no bug second line no bug so third sorry the third entry no bug and then at some point they'll get to a line where oh here's where the bug is i found the bug so we, we started asking ourselves how does it work in practice and we looked at the you know some of the evaluations and i'm going to show you uh, here one of those i mean there's been plenty and i'm going to do you uh, do it showing uh, um basically uh two sets of programs uh, that have been used for for a long time in a uh, in uh, software testing and debugging literature uh, one is the Siemens program, and the other one is the space program, which is a, it was a program from the space, uh, European Space Agency. And you know, the, the, what the programs do doesn't really matter too much. What matters is the way in which we're showing the results. So what we have here is, uh, you can see on the, on the x-axis is the percentage of programs to be examined to find the fault. So the idea is that you want to be at the, as, as uh, left as possible, because that means that you're going to find, you find the bug uh, very soon in your investigation. And on the y-axis, you see for how many versions this happens. So uh, basically for how many of the bugs uh, you have to examine this much of the program. So what you wanna have, and it's kind of, kind of hard to do it without a, a whiteboard, but basically what you're gonna have, and I don't know if I can show you uh, uh, a pointer, well, apparently not, but basically what, what you wanna do is, uh, is to be kind of all on this side, on the left, on the left side of the, of the graph and have some sort of curve of this of this kind and uh, uh, if you look at the evaluation and the, the way it worked uh, and if we focus on the one for space you can see that pretty much this is what you get so you had uh, uh, this uh, line and uh, you can see that for 10 uh, percent for for sorry over 80 percent of the bugs considered uh, you have to look on the 10 percent of the program to find them and if you think about it on paper that's great that means that you have a technique, technique that is totally automated. So you just provide your test cases in your program to the technique, and the technique is uh, allowing you to, to just look at 10% of the program and, and, uh, and, and find the bug. So it's giving you this list where you only have to look at that. And, uh, and so you know, basically, you know, is that mission accomplished? And that's where we started you know, looking at this in, in, in kind of more depth. And, and we figure out that 
one of the issues that there, there were a lot of uh, kind of uh, uh, assumptions that were not really mentioned in the you know in this uh, in, in this sort of uh, evaluation and the first assumptions is uh, that locating a bug in 10% of the code is a great result and i agree that it's better than finding it in a larger percentage of the code but the point is you know if you think about numbers right uh, 100 lines of code and you know and looking at finding the bug by looking only at 10 lines of code it's, it's probably very good uh, if you start having 10,000 lines of code, which is not a big problem by any stretch of the imagination, uh, you have to look at the thousand lines of code, and that already becomes uh, you know, less uh, uh, appealing. And then, you know, as soon as you get to kind of realistic pro program or realistic size, uh, the number of uh, lines of code the and the amount of code that you have to look at is really overwhelming. And so, we, we believe that this was uh, not a very realistic uh, uh, assumption. Assumption number two. Programmers exhibit a perfect bug understanding. So what does it mean? Well, it, it means that they can look at the, at the bug at the, in the code uh, without any additional context. So they see a line of code and they can uh, detect immediately whether that's a bug or not. And I mean, I'm not gonna show you on the code, I'm gonna show you sort of a, a metaphoric view of this. So if you show you this picture, right? And right away I ask you, do you see a bug? And maybe you see it, maybe not, right? So bugs are not that obvious in the code. And I have to say that when I gave an earlier version of this talk, somebody pointed out to me, uh, like, oh, it's not really a bug, it's a reptile, which is fine. So if we want to be precise uh, here, we got more pictures. This is another bug that is very well hidden in the code. And uh, here's uh, yet another bug that's even better hidden uh, in the code. So without showing 100 pictures of bugs, uh, you get the idea, right? So understanding whether something is a bug or not doesn't really require only to look at that line of code. It requires to kind of go through the code, get the state, get sometimes previous execution, look in another part of the execution. So it's a complex uh, operation. So again, we thought that perfect bug understanding is probably not a realistic assumption. And finally, the, the, the last assumption I want to mention is that programmers inspect a list linearly and exhaustively. So you can give programmers a very long list of ranked statements, and they will just go through every statement uh, one at a time until they find the bug. And we thought it was good for comparison. So if I need to compare two techniques, I, it's probably easy to put them together and one next to the other and show you that, well, you know, if, uh, if in my technique, the statement is ranked here and yours is here, my technique is better. So no doubt about that. But is it realistic? So it, is it, does the conceptual model make sense and have we evaluated it? And, uh, and we, we really wanted to do that. So I wanted to figure out whether we were heading in the right direction with this uh, work. And so what we did, uh, you know, uh, with uh, the, the then I was a student, uh, Chris Parney, he wasn't a student of mine, but he was an expert in uh, uh, user studies. And, I, I, and I, so we started talking about this. And we, we, we wrote this paper, our automated debugging techniques actually helping uh, programmers. Um, and, and then we also had some follow-up work about uh, uh, IRBs for localization. I'm merely going to talk about uh, the first one. And, uh, and, and not too much to talk about the work, but to talk about kind of the implications of the, of the work. So we, the, our question was, what do we know about automated debugging? Uh, how many studies on tool have been done, which means analytical studies in which you show that my technique is good because uh, it finds a bug in X percent of the code. And how many have been done on developers by showing that my technique is good because it helps developers. And uh, we looked at the, you know, all this literature, you know, years and years and years of research on debugging. And uh, what we found out is that despite all these techniques, uh, that the, the, the scale was very much stiff at the worst tool, to the point that there was only a handful of studies that, uh, now it's a little better, but at the beginning there was only a handful of studies that you know, had been uh, done uh, on actual developers. And the even more interesting uh, part of this was that for several of these studies, the, the, the results were negative. So the results were showing that the technique was not particularly useful for the developers, including you know, the, the very good paper from Wiser on, on, on slicing. So we thought that that was even more uh, striking. So we decided to investigate, uh, you know, uh, ourselves whether you know the techniques uh, and tools that were very popular uh, uh, at that time in terms of rank-based uh, uh, localization were actually helping programs. And so we took a state-of-the-art technique. We implemented it as an Eclipse plugin, uh, and basically what, what the, clip, the plugin was providing was a view in which, uh, if you had a failing execution and a test suite, it would basically show you the ranking of the statement uh, together with information about the. Uh, you know, where the statement was, in which file, uh, which line of code, uh, and uh, the value of the suspicions. And we investigated a number of questions. In particular, uh, do programmers who use automated debugging tools locate faster than programmers who do not use such tools? 
uh, which, you know, of course, it should be kind of an obvious thing. If, if the tools is useful, you know, it should have developers. Uh, is the effectiveness of debugging uh, with these tools affected by the uh, statements rank? So if a statement is ranked higher, is, do, the, do the developers perform better if, if it's ranked lower? Uh, do developers navigate a list of statements ranked by suspiciousness in the order provided? Uh, so if I give you a list, do they navigate those lists, this list? And does perfect bug understanding exist? Is it really the case that developers can look at uh, a line of code and decide whether it's bug or not? We did, uh, as I said, you know, multiple studies. I'm just going to talk about, the, about the, the one about spectra-based for localization. And I'm going to give you quickly uh, the, the, you know, the experiment protocol. Uh, uh, we have 34 participants. And I call them developers. Uh, I have to say, you know, one of the caveats is that they were uh, master students, as it's often the case. But uh, we, be, we were careful about trying to have like a, people with different expertise. So we had in the, in the set uh, people with high expertise, which were people that had worked in companies before or were working in companies when they uh, were studying. Uh, we had people with medium expertise, which were the ones that had done at least one internship in a company, and the one with low expertise, the ones that never worked in a company. So we classified them. Um, we had, uh, you know, in terms of tools, uh, the, 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 the control technique uh, was basically, so that the treatment was basically that uh, uh, the rank-based tool, uh, which was an Eclipse plugin, as I said, and it was also performing some login, and uh, the baseline was like basically the Eclipse debugger or really anything that the developers wanted to do. And you know, without having access to the tool, of course. And uh, we had two uh, pieces of software, two programs. One was Tetris, and the other one was Nano XML. So one is a, a very famous game. The other one is a parser or XML. The Tetris bug is very intuitive. So what I'm showing you here, uh, I'm assuming that most of you uh, worked on Tetris, played on <laughs> worked, sure, uh, played Tetris at least once in your life, and you will know that if you rotate a block, the, the block should not move. And instead, the bug here was making the, the block rotate if you uh, move, uh, sorry, but on the side, uh, if you were to rotate it. So we consider this to be easy because the, the, the game is well understood and uh, it's, uh, it's a very straightforward uh, uh, issue, sorry, right? You can figure out that it has to do with rotation and so on. Support is related to a square and so on. The number XML bug was a little more subtle so that there was a problem with the parser. And so if you were submitting some specific XML document, it was crashing. And we consider this harder because parses are harder than games, uh, and, and also it's not so obvious what's going, what's going wrong. Uh, we, we, uh, we had like two tasks for the uh, developers. One was to uh, find the fault in Tetris. The other one was to find the fault in NanoXML. We gave 30 minutes per task, and we had a questioner uh, at the end in which we were asking various uh, questions. Uh, we had like, you know, the two, uh, the, the study was done in two parts. In the first part, we had like, two groups. Uh, uh, group A was using the tool uh, on Tetris to debug Tetris and no tool to debug on XML. Group B was doing the opposite, you know, no tool for Tetris and tool for non XML. The second part in which we studied some of the other research questions, we had everybody using the tool, but what we did basically was artificially lowering and, and, and raising uh, the rank of the, uh, of the faulty statement. So for Tetris, we, we pushed it from 7 to 35. From, uh, for uh, NanoXML, we pushed it from 80, 83 to 16. What, what that means is that uh, the, the statement would have normally be ranked the faulty statement in position 7, and we pushed it down, or in position 83, and we pushed it up. And basically, we divided and multiplied by 5 for, for lack of a better number. So we just wanted to have some sort of a, uh, you know, differences in the, in the ranking. And here's the study results. And so what we did, we basically measured the performance in terms of locating the bug and speed of locating the bug uh, for the various uh, groups, so A versus B versus C versus D. And uh, what we have you know, here is like, you know, when we look at you know, uh, A uh, versus B for Tetris, there was no significant difference in the performance. And sadly enough, uh, we, we basically didn't observe any statistical difference for any of these uh, studies or any of these comparisons. And uh, there's a, it's, a, it's kind of a you know, disappointing result, if you wish, but uh, there was some silver lining, which was uh, when we stratified the participants in terms of expertise uh, in, in, uh, in development, we found that you know, the, the, um, the high performance, so the developers with the industrial experience were doing significantly better uh, in debugging theaters with the tool than without the tool. So that, that this really was a silver lining because it showed that the tool was useful for uh, the developers. 
the, the only issues that, you know, further analysis actually showed us that it was useful, but not in the way we thought. And I'll, I'll tell you more about this in a, in a second. So we did an, an analysis of the results and of the questionnaires, and this is the findings in a, in a nutshell. So for RQ1, uh, does the tool help developers? Uh, it does. So experts are faster when using the tool, but with caveats. And so what is the caveat? So first of all, that they have to be expert. And second, that the, the reason why it worked well for the expert, which we found out from the questionnaire, was because uh, that's the way they used the tool. Instead of going through the list of ranked uh, statement, what they did is they started looking at the program and they got an idea of what they thought was wrong with the program. And they thought that what was wrong with the program had to do with rotation and had to do with the shapes. So they looked at the rank list and they, they went to the first uh, statement that had to do with rotation. So in a, in a, in a program, in a, in a function that had to do with rotation and bang, they found the problem right away. So they basically uh, did, you know, use their intuition to find what the problem was. And then they augmented the intuition with the tool. And that to us was a very enlightening uh, uh, kind of discovery because uh, uh, you know, opened the door to kind of this idea of, uh, well, what you want to do really is not just uh, kind of guide the developers towards the, the, the fault, but you want to kind of amplify uh, you know, the developer's intuition. And, and I'll get back to that when I talk about the future. For RQ2, uh, effectiveness of debugging with automated tools uh, uh, and, and uh, faulty statement rank, uh, we found no differences. So changes in rank, so whether the statement was uh, at position 7 or 35 didn't matter. Whether it was position 83 or 16 didn't matter. Uh, do developers navigate a list of statement rank for, for suspiciousness? To answer this question, we looked at the logs and we found out that developers at most went to two or three statements and then they gave up. On, on the tool. And this is also the reason why you know, the answer to the previous one is, uh, is no, because just developers do not go through a list of statements. Uh, and when they start getting full positive, they basically give up. And finally, does perfect bank understanding exist? Uh, to answer this question, we looked at the, uh, uh, at the logs and we found out the difference in time between when the developers marked that they had found the, the bug and the first time that they clicked on the, on the faulty line. And we found that the average was like 10 minutes. And 10 minutes, if you think about it, for a code that is relatively simple, is kind of a long time. And it's also an average, which means that some people are faster, some people were slower. And so it, going back to the initial number that we mentioned, if you have to look at a, you know, 100 statements, 100 multiplied by 10, that turns out to be quite a long time and also sort of a frustrating time. And that's also the reason why people will give up if they start finding uh, false positives. Okay, so that's, that was the, the result and, and what kind of motivated us to, to, to start to looking for you know, alternative and different ways of, of doing this. And I'm going to talk, I don't have much time, I got 10 minutes, and I'm going to talk about uh, uh, a couple of directions, probably one actually. Uh, let's see how much, uh, how much can I do. Uh, you're going to get all the slides anyways. Uh, so the, the first one is feedback-based debugging or you know, humans in the loop. And here the intuition is that we should really, as I was saying before, amplify rather than replace human skills. So there, there is no way that you're going to be able to do debugging in a fully, at least in my opinion, in a fully automated way, because it's such a human intensive uh, uh, task. And, it, and if you've done it, you will know what I'm talking about. So sure, the, the machine can help me, but you know, the, the intuition of where the problem is and, and the, the, the discovery where the problem is has to be coming from the human. So with uh, you know, uh, my, my student, Zhang Yuli, and, and uh, uh, my, my colleague, Marcel Van Marina, we, we, we had this idea of starting to investigate this uh, kind of more interactive way of doing things. And we had kind of an initial short paper on that. And then we published uh, in, uh, in 2018 uh, this technique called Enlightened uh, Debugging. And um, in, the, in this case also, you know, we have uh, you know, Xiao Wei uh, joining the, uh, as an undergraduate researcher, now a PhD student, uh, uh, the, the group. And I'm going to give you again the, the intuition about this because you know we don't have enough time to go into the details. But we, we thought about you know full localization. We thought about uh, you know rank-based techniques and why you know they, we believe that they couldn't work in practice because of these assumptions. And so what we did was we started kind of going back to the drawing board and thinking, well, how do people really debug? And in my opinion, and you know feel free to disagree in the audience. Uh, um, it's, you can, I guess you can disagree on Slack because you kind of scream at me. But uh, uh, in a my opinion, that's the way it works. You know, you got some passing and failing executions. You started looking at those and, and you have a conjecture of the full cause. So you, in your mind, you create some sort of hypothesis of why the problem is failing. Then you look at partial execution. So after you've done that, you might put some print statements, you might put some watch points, you might put some breakpoints, but you basically start looking at partial executions that are gonna either confirm or refuse 
uh, your con conjecture, your uh, you know, uh, intuition. And at this point, you go back and you refine the intuition, either you find the, find the bug or you refine the intuition and you keep iterating in, a, in this loop until finally you find the bug. And so what we thought is like, okay, which parts of this process can we actually uh, automate? So can we still stay within this uh, kind of frame and uh, uh, within this framework and, and, and automate some parts? And so we, and we were wanted to use actually software for localization because we believe that that's a very powerful technique. And so what we did with, uh, was that to kind of plug that in and say, what if we use the software for localization as the, the definition of the initial conjecture or the fault cause? And, and at this point, once we have that, we basically create some partial execution that automatically that we can show the developer. And the idea there was that why don't we use method level execution? So basically we find the, the, the execution of a specific method that's most suspicious and we use that to, uh, to basically uh, to, to present as a query to the user that can then tell us, yeah, I think the bug is here or not. And I'll, I'll be more concrete in a second. And at this point, once we have this question uh, by showing inputs, execution of the method and outputs and the developer can tell us uh, yes, I think this execution is fine, or no, I think it's buggy, or I don't know. We can refine, uh, you know, the, the, the localization and iterate over this process. Uh, so the way we do it is like, you know, we have this, uh, uh, you know, combined static and dynamic analysis uh, to build uh, this sort of, uh, uh, you know, a set of incorrect data items. Uh, I, I'm going to kind of uh, skip through these, uh, uh, to these details again. You can. Uh, you can see them, we have a paper on this, you can see them on the paper if you're interested. I'm gonna give you the intuition with an example. So imagine that you have uh, this uh, um, bounded stack and the bounded stack is using uh, an array of uh, integer elements uh, and it uses a number of elements, a value, integer value to define uh, how many elements are there. And uh, there is a test that fails for this stack uh, in which if you uh, push something on the stack, you clear the stack, you do a pop and then you do a peak uh, what you're expecting to get is a null element and instead you get a crash. And the reason for this is that the, the pop method uh, that is decreasing the number of elements without checking, okay? So if you were to do full localization, uh, traditional full localization, uh, the traditional full localization will tell you basically the method clear and this instruction that the null elements equal to zero is the most suspicious. So what, we, what our technique does, and again, at an intuitive level, you know, kind of high level view, is it will build a query for the user in which you'll say, okay, we observe in this test, this execution of this method uh, clear that takes this input, provides this output, and uh, does it look okay to you? And if you look at this, the input is uh, uh, basically a bounded stack with uh, these two elements, seven and eight, and the output is a bounded stack with zero elements uh, and uh, looks okay. So the user will imagine will click okay. And at this point, what we do, we create some sort of virtual execution that we plug into the uh, statistical for localization. We refine the ranking and we will get another query. In this case, the query is, uh, if we do a push, uh, does it look correct to you? And so we will take that specific execution and we will show it to the developer. In this case, you can see that value seven is pushed into an empty stack and the result is a stack with one element uh, and uh, the element is seven. So again, we mentioned the developer will push okay. And um, after pushing OK, we will refine again, and we get the third query, which is basically uh, uh, showing uh, you the, the, the pop method, and where you have uh, as input uh, an empty stack, and uh, when you and as a, as an output of that, the result will be that you have a negative number of elements. And as a developer, you will realize that that's a mistake, and you would have found your bug. Again, this is just a, you know kind of a high-level description, but gives you an idea how. Uh, Providing, so using statistical for localization in order to uh, identify relevant parts of the execution and then providing queries that are of a level of abstraction that is easily understood by the developer can help uh, debugging. And uh, so just to give, give an idea, you know, we, we showed that we did a buffer simulated user study in which we, we showed that on a large number of faults, uh, uh, it took less than 10 interactions to localize the fault. And we also did an actual user study in which we showed that you know, the use of the tool will help users localize more faults and also faster. Uh, I would have loved to talk also about formula-based debugging. Uh, I, don't, I won't have time, but I will highly recommend if you're interested in debugging to look at this because this is an area in which I think that there's a lot of room for good research. It's, uh, it's a technique that is very, very powerful. So you use basically mathematical reasoning 
to uh, provide uh, uh, you know, buy information on a very principled way. And uh, unfortunately, it's extremely expensive. So if you have ideas on how to improve this, uh, I think you could really have a, you know, a, a big uh, impact. And with this, I'm going to go to the conclusion because I got just a couple of minutes uh, uh, left. And so in summary, what, what I would like you to take away from this is that uh, people have been working on debugging for a very, very long time. And they developed a lot, a lot of very interesting techniques. And so we came a very long way from the early days of, of debugging. And so we had, you know, you know, as I said, we talked about Delta debugging, uh, slicing, uh, full, you know, statistical full localization. Uh, with even, you know, it, it, you, I believe you also saw a presentation from Claire. And uh, Claire is like one of the kind of main uh, people behind, uh, you know, program repair. So it's even one step beyond uh, debugging and also pro providing automatic repair. For, for the programs, but I also think that there's a still a long way to go. And in fact, you know, the good news for people working in debugging is that the problem is far from being solved. So there's a lot of possible values. And I'm gonna conclude with uh, just a list of possible uh, topics that I think uh, would be interesting for, uh, for research. Uh, so one is uh, this idea of hybrid semi-automated for localization techniques. And again, techniques that combine human intelligence, for example, the ability of providing your hypothesis, and they support that. Uh, uh, failure understanding and, uh, and explanation. So techniques that in a principal way will explain where the bug is. This idea of big data debugging, which can mean both a debugging of field failure. So debugging where you have a lot of data and CPI was a very kind of early uh, uh, you know, instance of this. So using this, a lot of data, anonymized data in order to do debugging after you release the software. And this is by the way, being done by most companies. And also leveraging large code bases uh, for debugging. This idea that you can look at, the, you know, uh, now that we have all this code available, you can analyze the code and find, for example, bu uh, bug patterns. So uh, patterns that allow you to identify bugs and possibly also repairs. Uh, debugging on currency bugs is always an open problem. Uh, there's also semi-automated repairs and workarounds. And as I said, you know, you probably heard about that uh, from uh, Claire. And I just want to mention something that, you know, it's relatively recent. So how actually Facebook, uh, develop tools that learn to fix bugs uh, automatically. So they have this tool that automatically find fixes uh, for bugs and offers them to engineer. And it's even combined with their tools to identify uh, failures. So you develop you know, this nice uh, tooling in which you know, they, they generate inputs, they make the program fail, and then they also generate repairs for this failure. So it's very, very interesting technique and you know, used you know, in, in practice. And finally, I would like to, you know, uh, to leave you as a very last uh, takeaway message which is also true for other areas, by the way, it's not just for debugging, but uh, you know, don't pursue full automation at all costs. I mean, and I know, that, you know this is not necessarily a popular view, but I believe as a software engineer that one of the big curses is that we try to automate everything. And it's true that software engineering is about automation. So automate everything that you can automate. So automate the testing, automate the re, you know, regression testing, automate deployment, all of that is great. But you know, there are activities that are very human intensive. And I don't think that automation is a good way to go there. And I think it's kind of holding back the, the, you know, the area because what you want to look instead is a way in which you can support the developers. Uh, be careful and honest with your assumptions. So uh, the first time you develop a new technique, it, it's okay to kind of uh, make some strong assumptions uh, and, and then you know, try and just to see whether the technique makes sense. But after many years, uh, you want to really make your assumptions explicit and you, you want to revisit your assumptions to see whether they make sense in, uh, in practice. And finally, although I'm not a huge fan of user studies, not because I don't like them, but because they're so time confusing, <laughs> time confusing, right? So time consuming and, and so expensive. It's, it's very hard to do user studies. I have to say, I love doing experiments with tools. Doing user studies is very, very difficult and time consuming, but they, you can really learn a lot. So we, I learned a lot with a you know, few user studies that I've done, much more than just by, you know, with empirical uh, evaluations as, uh, you know, without involving users. And I think that's it. I just want to close with uh, you know, uh, acknowledgments and I want to thank people who you know, over the years uh, you know, contributed to this talk either indirectly with discussions or by you know, sending direct materials. Thank you so and much, thank you all for listening. Thank you. So we have some questions. So let's see. So Melosh has a question. Um, do we need domain specific debugging techniques? Uh, probably not one approach would work for each language and each type of software. For example, maybe we need something that's different for embedded software or for web-based software and so forth. Right. Yeah, I think that's, that's a great point. So there are principles that are very general 
and so things that you can apply you know for, for every kind of software but I, I think one of the keys to success is also being able to leverage uh, the specific aspects of the kind of software or the domain in which you're working so if you can do that i mean uh, you can develop the list that might not work in general but it can be much more powerful so yeah i, I guess my, my answer is uh, yes by all by all means every time uh, i see people applying general techniques to domains where you can be much more efficient by doing something more specific uh, I, I feel like that's a missed opportunity so i i believe that you know uh, it, it's very important to try to tailor uh, your techniques to the uh, to the, the reality of your domain and in fact if i can add, i know that you know, we're tight on time but something very quickly some of the examples i think of applications of these techniques very successfully in companies are also because there's a lot of tailoring uh, going on. And I don't see this as a criticism, it's a great idea, but you basically have a code base that you're working with and you can really kind of optimize uh, based on that. And, and that's, you know, another indication that, you know, working for the domain at, at hand can really, can really help. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question we have is uh, from Melosh, uh, which is on, uh, if you could comment maybe on some of the state of the art that's being used in industry uh, in the context of debugging? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good question, actually. It, it's somehow hard to, I, I think, to assess the state of the art because uh, uh, in some cases, I've been trying to figure out you know, what people are doing in practice. So I think for, for a lot of companies, there is a, a, a lot of, a, sort of a hard manual work. So I've been talking with several companies where debugging is done in a very traditional way. So people do, you know, uh, observe uh, uh, failures and they try to figure out what's going on. And there's also, you know, very interesting work. Like for example, the, the one I talked about uh, uh, just now about what they're doing at Facebook, that's a very interesting debugging approach that is very kind of a bleeding edge in which they're trying to do uh, automated repair. I know that, I don't know if I can mention companies, I know another big company that I, I've been talking to in which they do a lot of debugging by basically leveraging uh, user execution. So they, they get to the point of customizing the software for individual users when they uh, identify weird behaviors and they can use that to debug. So I, I, I don't know if it's possible to say, you know, this is what they do in, a, in, 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 in industry in general, but I, I think it's a mix of some very advanced techniques that have been tried out uh, and some very traditional uh, uh, approaches and uh, I, what I can tell you is that there's a lot of investment in, uh, in, 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 as you, I'm sure you know, in tooling. So people really build tons of tools specific for debugging uh, for, for various companies. And, and if you look at, this is public information, so I can mention it. If you look, for example, at Netflix, the way they do uh, kind of fault injections and in order to identify problems, so that's also very, very, very interesting. So they have this very complex uh, uh, architecture where they uh, inject uh, errors in microservices and then to identify them that way. So uh, I, I, it's, it's a whole universe out there. And, and, and I think that there's some very advanced work and some more traditional work. So I, I, I don't know if I can give you uh, just a one, uh, one answer, but one size fits all kind of answer. Yeah, good point. Thank you. Uh, another question is from uh, David uh, Travish. Um, could you comment about debugging cloud applications, serverless, etc.? cetera? Uh, all, all I can tell you is that it's a, it's a very interesting area. So I, I, I it, it's complicated because it depends, right? So there, there are some issues that are just traditional issues. So one, one of the things that I always kind of warn people about is just try not to reinvent the wheel. Is that I, I remember guilty as charged when I started, you know, my career was working on object-oriented testing. And basically, you know, we define all these techniques and then it turns out they were the same techniques that we were using for traditional software. It's just that we were doing an object-oriented software. So uh, there are some things that are specific and make things more complicated because you don't know where things are running. And there's a whole lot of uh, other, uh, you know, uh, issues that might cause failures that are not necessarily related to your code. And there's also a lot of, you know, kind of very traditional uh, issues that are the ones that, that are, uh, you know, traditional, you know, local, uh, you know, code issues. So I, I would say that, you know, some of the things that was mentioning before, for example, what Netflix is doing uh, with their uh, with their approaches, which is basically the debugging in the cloud are, are some of the techniques that have been uh, used in there, used there. Uh, if you're interested in the area, I will, I will focus on uh, what is specific to the uh, cloud and you know server or serverless application and they might go wrong uh, and that uh, uh, you know might require a specific techniques and i think that's a uh, you know uh, i don't know if this really answers your question but I, I, it's, it's just to confirm that i think it's very interesting 
topic uh, for, uh, for investigation. And last thing I want to mention is that we started looking into that actually. One of the main problems is finding uh, benchmarks. Because, you know, the, the way, I mean, I like to do research is always like, you know, you, you try to find a problem, you try to find instances of the problem, and then you want to kind of investigate it. it. It's very hard. So there is some work, early work uh, from various groups, like, for example, so the, if I remember correctly, Tao Shi's group uh, that I started to create some test beds. But it's, it's, very, it's very hard to find, uh, you know, code on which you can experiment with your technique. So I think it's an interesting topic. It would be great to have a set of benchmark on, on which to work. Uh, and, and I think finding, you know, techniques that are specialized to that domain will be a great idea. Very good, Alex. Thank you so much. So I think we are kind of out of time now. So it's been a pleasure. Right. I see Somesh there, you know, with, uh, with his mansion uh, behind him. So I don't want to <laughs> steal any of yeah, his that, time. Yeah, that is not my mansion. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, okay. I, I'm not in the Hampton either, so. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Okay, All right, well, so. you know, th th thank you very much for the opportunity. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Alex. I wish I could have done it in person. <laughs> Me too, yeah. Bye. All right. Enjoy so much. Take care. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. So I would like to mention everyone that now we are going to have